Judith Whelan was one of the most interested and interesting people I've ever known. If you don't know her name, you certainly know her impact because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it weren't for her. I literally quite logistically would not physically be in Australia necessarily were it not for her having noticed something in me when I was still living in New York City that she thought could benefit the public broadcaster. Others may have disagreed. Uh, certainly this was, this was not a unanimous point. But, of course, she was the most perspicacious one. She was the one with the on the right side of history uh, or perhaps given the way history unfolded the wrong side in hindsight. But she was trying to do something interesting at the public broadcaster. She was trying to make it a nimble and uh, brave place. When I say she brought me to Australia, she literally was in charge of the radio division and several other components of the ABC in 2017. And she was aware of the fact that I'd done a little bit of radio before uh, in the States and also in Australia, and that I had spent over a decade working in broadcasting in New York City already. And she did what at the time seemed like an impossible thing, which I don't believe has been done before with any quote unquote talent, which was she basically put me in a holding deal, which is entertainment industry jargon for when you know that you're going to want to use someone in the future, but you're not quite sure what to do with them now. So you pay them a bit too much money not to go somewhere else. She wanted to make it viable for me and my partner and the kids to move to Australia. So she got three different departments to chip in a bit of money each. One was podcasting. She gave me a weekly podcast. One was Radio National. She gave me a weekly panel show. And one was ABC Radio, uh, where she basically put me on this holding deal where I would fill in for the big presenters, the big hosts, while they were away, which they can be away quite a lot in radio. So there would be four or five months of the year where I would be jumping between either the breakfast show in the early mornings or the drive show or wherever I might be needed. And that was something that the public broadcaster frowned upon, the cardigan-wearing powers that be thought that that was a little bit of a frivolous expenditure. But what Judith understood that they didn't was that there isn't really a price you can pay on the future of the public broadcaster as a place that sounds like it is speaking to all Australians, not in some superficial diversity metric way, but in a way that resonates with people who don't necessarily agree with you. And if you're listening to this podcast and if you're a fan of this podcast and a fan of mine, you know that my overarching mission in life is to speak to people who disagree with me in ways that will sound comprehensible and that will sound generous towards their point of view. Judith saw that. Judith saw a lot. She went on to persuade the man who founded the uh, the breakfast television show, the morning television show on ABC TV, to give me a shot at co-anchoring the weekend uh, television news. So for a while there, I was <laughs> doing five days a week on weekdays of radio, of a three-hour radio show from six to nine in the morning, and then on the weekends going into the television studios and co-anchoring the morning show on the public broadcaster. It was a lot of work. It was incredibly exciting. Because I was an independent contractor, I was allowed to get around ordinary labor rules that would have prohibited working seven hours a week, but I was my own thing. I wasn't technically an employee. And she fought for me. Judith fought for me every step of the way against people who valued hierarchy more than innovation, against people who valued bureaucracy more than nimbleness, um, against people who valued speaking in a way that is very comfortable and comforting to our preconceptions and our biases, that mollycoddles the audience over a way of speaking that actually challenges the audience. Judith had been struggling with breast cancer for as long as I knew her, but struggling is the wrong word. She took it in her stride. She always had a sunny disposition. Um, I thought it was in remission. I knew there were ongoing uh, treatments. There was a little bit of chemo here, a bit of chemo there. And just a few weeks ago, she and I were texting about how we would catch up and get a coffee in Balmain where she lived, the suburb of Sydney in which I coincidentally happened to have been born and raised. And uh, she texted me back a few days beforehand saying, look, this latest round of chemo has me uh, feeling a little bit crook and uh, a bit slow, I'm afraid. Can we rain check? And that was the last that I heard from her until I saw the news this morning that she died last night. 
she went into bat for people she believed in in an incredible way. She didn't grow up at the ABC. She came actually through the Fairfax Press, which um, owns the Sydney Morning Herald. And she was at one stage an editor of Good Weekend magazine, which is the the weekend magazine of Australia's uh, of Sydney's number one broadsheet newspaper. And she was so sparkly and innovative, and she knew what audiences wanted, and she knew how to spot potential talent. And so there was a big snafu a few years ago when she basically brought me back to Australia on this holding deal in order to line me up to host one of the big radio shows on ABC Radio Sydney, either The Breakfast Show, 6 to 9 in the morning, or The Drive Show, which is roughly um, 3 to 6 in the afternoon. And when one of those slots became available, there was an internal power struggle between, at this stage, she had been promoted to a director status at the ABC, and there was an internal power struggle between her and her underlings. There was a sort of an insurgency from some of the underlings who were the types of people who valued seniority and hierarchy who said that there was another person who should take that job who should who basically had been waiting around for longer than me she knew that didn't work that wouldn't work she knew that that person wasn't right for that shift you know personalities are very different it depends on your style whether or not you're going to work at a particular time of day they wanted to park me in the afternoon slot which is you know 12:30 to 3:30 in the afternoon uh, the kinds of ways that i talk about things which can be occasionally acerbic and fast and quick-witted and snarky just come across as a bit sort of arrogant and hyper intellectual at 1 in the afternoon at 7 a.m. they can work at 1 in the afternoon not so much so i shoulder full responsibility for not having been able to make that show as brilliant as the person who did it before me was able to because he was able to weave incredible stories and whimsy out of the smallest uh, facets of everyday life. Not necessarily my forte. Um, but uh, at the end of that whole experience, when my time at the ABC was falling apart, I remember calling her from, I was at O'Hare, the airport in Chicago. I was changing planes uh, on my way back to Australia. And I called her and I said, uh, I'm not going to be at the ABC anymore. And by this stage, her illness was sufficiently problematic, at least in terms of her energy levels, that she'd stepped back and she was on sick leave. Um, and I remember her reaction because it was so full of fury at the powers that be for having muddled and fumbled and dropped the opportunity that she thought she'd given them in backing me time and time again. And it was so full of love for me, it was so full of love for the values that we shared as journalists, as communicators, as broadcasters. There was not an ounce of mopiness or regret. She said, oh, that's nonsense. They are bloody idiots. She named people by name saying, oh, this person is such a fink. <laughs> <laughs> and she got sort of, she started to ruminate on her decision some years ago when there was this battle over the big show that ultimately didn't go to me. She started to ruminate about the fact that she had sort of taken the approach of, look, I'm senior management. This is speaking in her voice now. I'm senior management, and part of my job is sometimes to allow underlings to make the wrong decision and let them lie in the bed they made. And that was a decision that she came to regret, as she said to me on the phone from Chicago airport. She said, you make one bad decision, Josh. I said, don't worry about it. You don't have 100% knowledge at the time at which you're making these decisions. But she was always coming from this place of passion, excitement, possibility. She was a person who always said yes. She was not a no person. You know how there are cultures that just seem like yes cultures and the cultures that seem like no cultures? It's something that I felt when I first moved to New York City, that the whole city was a place of yes. You know, you'd come up with an idea for something and you'd talk to someone at a party about it or at a, at a bar and they'd be like, oh, that's great. You know, maybe I could, you know, I know so-and-so who you should get a coffee with and maybe, you know, that I like look forward to seeing it. You'd make the same proposition or talk about the same dream in Australia and someone would say, 
Yeah, no, nah, someone tried that once. Yeah, it didn't it didn't go so well. Yeah. It's a culture of no in some ways instead of a culture of yes. And she was inside an institution that can sometimes frustratingly get itself tangled up in no's, in process, in bureaucracy. Well, we don't do that here. We don't do this thing here. There's no money for it. You know, the ABC, unfortunately, has suffered major budget cuts over the past couple of decades. And so there is an ethos of like, we can't do that. We don't do that. There's no money for that. And I would occasionally float ideas for her when she was basically my boss's boss's boss. And her response was always, if it's a great idea, let's do it. Absolutely. And I'd say, but isn't there no money? And she sort of looked at me and scowled and said, Josh, there is always money. Just depends what you do with it. I pitched her a show once as my dad was starting to get Alzheimer's. And I'll come to my dad in a second. But I just want to eulogize Judith properly first. Uh, I pitched her a show which would be called Are You There, Dad? And would document the decline of my father into the fog of Alzheimer's, probably as a radio show, maybe a six-part radio show released as a podcast. And she looked at me and she said, that's a great idea. And I said, what should I do? And she stared at me and said, go and talk to your mum. <laughs> she also gave me great personal advice when she knew that I was having kids. She said, uh, I've got one thing to say to you about having babies, Josh. Don't be afraid of them. As long as they're warm, as long as they're fed, as long as they're housed and clothed, they will terrify you if they can. But just regard the screaming as the meaningless ejaculations of a little mammal. Don't be afraid of them. Don't let them scare you. You're the grown-up. You know everything. They know nothing. And let me tell you, in some quiet moments of desperation, <laughs> when we had screaming three-month-old twins, that came in very handy. She was a wise person. She was a generous person. She was a generous person in the sharing of her wisdom. And I'm going to miss her. It, it's a real blow. And it, it comes two weeks after the death of another really important person to me, which perhaps is why what motivated me to put these thoughts down in this way, which is who is Howard Feynman. Now, Howard uh, was, uh, I believe, the news director of the Huffington Post when I came on to HuffPost Live in New York, and he had previously been the editor of Newsweek. He was a huge Washington journalist insider, and he had every reason to have heirs. He had every reason to have an attitude of being better than me, this kid from Sydney who knew nothing about the way that American politics or broadcasting worked, and yet... He bounded onto that HuffPost Live set the first time I interviewed him with such a cheeky vigor and such insightful wisdom and such a playfulness that he and I immediately hit it off. I ended up going over to his place in Washington, D.C. and meeting his wonderful wife. And I <laughs> just would get him on the show as much as I possibly could when I was on HuffPost Live because he was both insightful and also a joyful person to listen to and watch. And uh, I emailed him last year and he emailed back a one sentence reply saying, Josh, I'm currently battling pancreatic cancer. And so I called him and we spoke and we had one of those conversations where both of you know that it's the last time you'll probably speak. And I told him how much I admire him and what a, what a powerful mentor he was to me. And he told me, all the nice things that would make me blush if I repeated them here. And then we said goodbye. And then two weeks ago, I read that he was gone. And the common theme, I think, between Judith and Howard, Howard was 75, Judith only 62, was the power of having someone believe in you. Especially if that person is a stranger. And especially, especially if that person is willing to go out on a limb for no obvious reason to defend the things that you believe in and to defend you in the process. Judith made it possible for me to come from the United States to Australia. She made it possible for me to support my family. She gave me a foot in the door at the ABC. She got me the weekend breakfast television show. She fought for me uh, in the battle over the breakfast show at ABC Radio, which I'm now so grateful that I didn't win because it allows me to speak here instead of speaking inside the echo chamber. Judith and I both were at the ABC, but not of the ABC. She represented its greatest 
traditions. I think I represented its greatest traditions. There's just a battle for the heart and soul of public broadcasting at the moment and the ABC will be at a great loss not having her vision, her playfulness and her spirit of saying yes. You know, there are executives who believe in seniority and process and punishing whistleblowers and kowtowing to internal insurrections. There are, in other words, cowards. Judith was not a coward. She was brave, fierce, wise, loving. When she said, you make one bum decision, Josh, on the phone to me in Chicago, I didn't realize then that that one bum decision was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because here I am, 